Nashville. It's so good to see all of you here. And I know that we have so many watching online. So I need to share with you guys something before I pray. You know, every now and then, and I know we've probably all experienced this in our lives at some point, every now and then, someone preaches a message that absolutely changes your life and you never forget it. And for those of you that had to work today and you couldn't be here, or those of you online that had to work and you couldn't be here, Pastor Candy Christmas preached one of the most phenomenal messages that I have ever heard. And I'm going to make it my business to share it with the whole world. And if y'all will join me, I won't have to work so hard. Because this is a message that every person on the planet needs to hear. So you have to go back after the conference is over or if you have free time tomorrow afternoon. I promise you it will absolutely change your life. We were kneeling at the altar after that. I mean, it, it was a word from God. And as Pastor Kent said to me tonight, that he thinks it's the very best that he has ever heard Pastor Candy. And I love you so much, girl. You touched me this morning. So y'all give her a hand. Give her a hand. And I want y'all to share that with so many people that goes viral, okay? Can, will y'all promise? Don't be telling me you're going to do it if you're not going to do it now, because I believe in people keeping their word. So, right? Okay, I'm going to go back. I, I need to go back and listen and watch again, because there was such an impartation that was given to us through that word. So, Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this night that you have planned for us. And we thank you, Father God, for the Holy Spirit of the living God to move as only he wills. And Father, I thank you that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we decree, this is, this is, a, this is a fire conference. We decree the fire of God to fall in this place tonight in Jesus' name. Signs, wonders, miracles. Lord, you have given us such an amazing speaker. You've given us such an amazing worship leader and choir, musicians. You have given us uh, so many people tonight that are so anointed of God. So, Lord, we just, we just release the power and anointing of God. And we say, have your way in this place. We decree the name of Jesus is above every name that can be named. We decree signs, wonders, miracles, healings. And, Father, we say we give you permission to work in us, both to will and to do your good pleasure. Put your hands on your ears. Lord, give me ears to hear and give me a heart to receive what the Spirit of the Lord wants to do in me tonight. And we agree together, Father God, in Jesus' name, and we thank you with great expectation for everything that you have planned for us. Amen. Why don't we stand together and worship the Lord? Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. He's worthy.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We worship. We worship. We worship. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, I feel him in this place. Press in and don't let him go.
Amen. God has honored us tonight with his presence. You can feel it so thick in this place. And there's nothing like the presence of God. You can't get this anywhere else. And I'm so thankful to have a father that would show up in this house in such a strong and powerful way. These are the kind of atmospheres that God moves in, that God meets a need in, that God changes a situation and changes a heart in. There's nothing like it. I was thinking today on, um, on the widow woman, and uh, I'll go ahead and read it to you, Luke chapter 21, verse 1 through 4, and sometimes I just like how the message puts it, and it says, just then, talking about Christ, he looked up and saw the rich people dropping offerings in the collection plate, and then he saw a poor widow put in two pennies, and he said, the plain truth is that the widow is given by far the largest offering today. All these others made offerings that they'll never miss, but she gave extravagantly what she couldn't afford. She gave her all. And it made me think of Pastor Candy's message today because behind the widow's offering was her heart. And it wasn't the offering that moved Christ. It was her heart that she gave with the offering and so I just encourage you tonight, as, as, as you give your offering, as you sow your seed, to put your heart behind it. Because your heart determines your harvest. And it moves Christ. And so today as you're giving, I, I, just, I just encourage you to contemplate that it's not just a seed you're sowing, but it's your heart that you're sowing. And you're saying, Christ, today I give you my all. And And that it makes a sweet aroma go up before the Father. And he then has to move on your behalf. And I think there's already a presence of God here tonight. And he's looking out. And I I pray that as you're giving tonight that it would move Christ to comment. Because your heart is behind it. Uh, And so we'll pray over the offering. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you have honored us with your presence here. Lord, tonight, God, we commit to you not just to give another offering, Lord, but to put our hearts behind it, Lord, to put our everything before you and say, God, we just want to be a pleasing aroma before you tonight. God, we welcome you in this house. God, we come expecting. Lord, we thank you, God, that this is just a taste of what is yet to come in this service. God, we prepare our hearts to receive all that you would pour out, Lord, tonight. Let us not walk away missing anything that you would give us. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, uh, ushers, you may serve the people. Praise the Lord, Regeneration Nashville. How are you doing? Are you tired yet? Good, good. I'm just telling you, the atmosphere is seeded with miracles and signs and wonders. I'm so excited about Miracle Night tomorrow night. But I'm telling you, tonight is Miracle Night, too. We have so many people that I have met that have come in for healing. And so I just want uh, everybody online to know that if you, if you want a healing in your body, So this is Pastor Kent's vision for tomorrow night. It's very exciting to me. He wants to lay hands on every person in the building. So get ready. We're going to have a powerful night tomorrow night. Yes, amen. And so um, it's just going to be exciting, and we have people behind the scenes working on logistics to do that. But uh, if you are watching online right now and you're in another country, you're in a state where there's lockdown, 
right now in the name of Jesus, we pull you into this atmosphere and we send the power of the Holy Ghost into your home, into your body, into your family, into your situation in Jesus' name. Because you are engaged here, you are part of us and you are part of our family. And so we welcome you. Welcome. If no one's told you they love you today, I want to be the first. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I have some acknowledgments that I want to make. First of all, uh, tonight I think will be the only night that our covering uh, is in this house. That's Pastor Harry Saylor and Pastor Hans Hess. They both are here. I've told you this so many times. It is very, very important that you are covered. And then it's very important who covers you. Because what they're flowing in flows down. And so it needs to be a pure stream. And so we believe that our ministry is covered by pure men of God. And we want them to stand. I just want to acknowledge you both. Pastor Harry Saylor and Pastor Hans Hayes. Give, give them a wonderful. We love them. Covenant friends for many, many years. They speak into our lives and into our ministry. They pray for us. I also want to acknowledge Pastor uh, DJ Shoulders. Pastor DJ Shoulders is a uh, fellow pastor here in Nashville uh, First Apostolic Church. The man can preach the house down. He can preach the house down. And so I just want you to stand and let us welcome you to Regeneration Nashville. We love you so much. God bless you. And uh, P Pastor Jerry and Martha Ford, they come all the way from Kentucky. They're part of our uh, just covenant friends, and I want them to stand and let's welcome them from uh, Kentucky, Owensboro, Kentucky. We love them. We love you. Brother Charlie Beatonbow and his wife, I just want you all to stand and let us welcome you. They're traveling itinerant ministries. Go ahead and give them a, a good. We love you all. So uh, we just, uh, of course, Brother Timothy Dixon is in the house. We're excited about uh, his ministry in the morning. And so I'm just telling you, we have a powerful lineup. There has been a shift in the atmosphere. Do you feel that? There's been a shift in the atmosphere. And so the Holy Ghost has come with purpose tonight. So I just want to ask, first of all, I met a, a couple from Canada. Where are you? Please stand and let us welcome you. We're so glad. And anybody else from Canada? So glad to have you here. Um, who, who have I missed that you're, you've come from out of town, out of state? Did I hear Montana? Montana, wow, welcome. Welcome to Nashville. Some good old humidity. <laughs> All right. So uh, who else did I hear? Alabama? Alabama, stand up. Let's welcome Alabama. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Who else am I missing? Pennsylvania. Stand up, Pennsylvania. Welcome to Nashville. Yeah, over here too. So glad to have you here. All right. South Dakota. Stand up, South Dakota. We're glad to have you. Welcome. So did I hear Louisiana? Indiana. Close enough. Stand up. <laughs> glad to. Oh, yeah. Lots of Indiana folk. Yeah. Glad to have you. What else? New York, New York. This lady's from upstate New York. Go ahead and stand up. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Welcome. And you're from New York. All right. Redding, California. Wow, stand up. Let us welcome you. We're so happy you're here. Oh, my goodness. All right, who else? Michigan. Stand up, Michigan. Welcome. Welcome. I, I, sir? Illinois. Stand up, Illinois. Welcome to Nashville. Glad to have you. Oh, lots of Illinois. Yeah. Wow. We got in a Illinois family. North Carolina. Stand up, North Carolina. Welcome to Nashville. Wow. Here too. Yeah. Amen. South Carolina. Stand up, South Carolina. Georgia. 
Georgia, Georgia, stand up. Anybody from Georgia, welcome. So actually this could really go on all night. I think we have 30 countries represented in this room. Aren't you thankful for that? God's just bringing the body of Christ together. Uh, just give me another one or two. Texas, did I hear? Kansas, click your heels and go home. Stand up. Let us welcome you. <laughs> ah, glad you're here. Thank you. What else? All right. Iowa, stand up, Iowa. Welcome to Nashville. Welcome to Nashville. We're so happy to have you. Where is, is Jasmine and John Michael still back here? Where are they at? Where's Jasmine and John Michael? I wanted y'all to see my family. I want y'all to see my kids. They're probably, she's moving slow these days. Did you notice? She's not jumping quite as high. Hey, ladies, uh, even if you're from out of town and you want to come in on May the 7th, we're having a baby shower. If you didn't notice, we're having us a baby. And that baby's going to be here uh, June the 15th, and it is a little girl. And we're having a baby shower celebration. Gifts are not mandatory at all, uh, but just come and celebrate. And so just come here, come here, come here, Nicholas. Come here, Carrie. I want y'all to see my beautiful family. Look, she's already changed her shoes. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just proud of my family. I'm proud of my children. And they love Jesus. They follow hard after Christ, all of them. And I, and, uh, So I just wanted you to see them. Thank you so much for loving our family. That's good. Thank you. Uh, they're hard workers. All of them work here in the ministry, and uh, they have their roles. Nicholas is the youth pastor. Carrie is the children's pastor. Jasmine is the worship pastor. And John Michael takes care of all of us, <laughs> and he's over the product. And so I just wanted you to, to see our family, and uh, thank you for your love, your support. Uh, I, I do want to say this, and, and then I'm going to get out of the way. But you guys carried us in prayer, and I know that, and I felt that, and I feel that. And I can't thank you enough for your support in prayer and your love, the outpouring of love to our family. So just wanted, wanted to say thank you. Uh, okay, so I have some wonderful friends that I want to introduce. Um, oh, don't forget the fellowship on Saturday. We're going to eat together on Saturday. So, uh, so Higher Ground has, is celebrating 50 years of ministry. They uh, are members here at Regeneration Nashville, but they are, uh, wow, I wish those words were bigger. I totally cannot see that. But so I'm just going to, I'm just going to fly by the seat of my pants here. Uh, so they're very prophetic. They're songwriters and uh, they teach uh, worship seminars and symposiums, but most of all, they're lovers of Jesus. And I want you to give it up for Wayne Hilliard and Higher Ground. Amen. Just feel with the Holy Ghost. 
Amen. God bless you. Be seated. This is that. Amen. You know, it must have been an amazing thing with all the confusion that was in the upper room. And sitting over in the corner was this man who felt like a failure. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God that had filled him with the Holy Ghost clicked in him. And he's sitting there thinking, oh, my, this is that. Hallelujah. That was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then all of a sudden, he come out of that corner of failure, began to look at him. He said, these men are not drunk like you suppose. Because the only time they'd ever seen anybody act like that was when somebody was drunk. But God said, I'm going to show you what people do when they get drunk on the Holy Ghost. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith the Lord, I'm going to open up the heavens and I'm going to begin to pour out upon you a dose of the Spirit of God. So by the time I get done with you, uh, your young men will see visions. uh, Your old men will dream dreams. uh, And then he said, I'm going to dump it on your kids uh, and on your children uh, and on your grandchildren. uh, And they're going to prophesy. And it's going to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord. So this is that. I think that this conference is about the best kept secret in the United States. If you are hungry for a demonstration of the Spirit of God, and I promise you we are in the infancy stages. I believe that we're going to surpass Toronto. We're going to surpass Brownsville. I don't say that arrogantly. I'm simply telling you that there is a God portal that has been opened up in the atmosphere. Pastor Harry and I were talking about this today. Nashville is the number one housing market in the United States of America. We are called the Little Vatican of the world. We are number one in religious publication. We are number one in religious... Um, producing. Uh, We are number one in the world. We have more churches per capita than any city in the earth. There is a reason why God has picked this place. And you and I get to be a part of that. Hallelujah. We are going to see with our eyes The glory of God manifested. Hallelujah. So when you come to our conferences, and, and, and we're still trying to figure out how to make this work, but I can tell you this, and I promise you, you will never leave disappointed because we make room for the apostolic, Holy Ghost, tongue talking, running the aisles, laying hands on the sick, liberating people from demon possession, You say, well, what kind of church is that? Bible. We are a Bible church. We are Bible-based, Bible-centered. And I say as Paul, I am not ashamed of the apostolic Holy Ghost, apostolic outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this hour. We're going to shout. We're going to dance. We're going to weep. We're going to praise. We're going to run. Hallelujah. We're going to watch the miraculous take place. We're going to make demons tremble till they run for the exits. Hallelujah. And there is such a charge of the anointing of God that begins to get loose in the atmosphere. And all of a sudden, you can't help it. But the Spirit of God begins to loose you, heal you, deliver you, incite you, invigorate you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. My goodness, I'm not even the preacher tonight. <clears throat> Hallelujah. God bless you. You can be seated. I-, I wanted to say this. My wife mentioned Pastor D.J. Shoulders 
And I felt remiss if I did not say this to this church. He is, number one, uh, one of the best preachers that I've ever heard. And um, the day that Joshua died was a Sunday, and I was, I was showering, getting ready to come to church. And, of course, we got the call, and I knew I couldn't come to church and preach. And I thought, what do I do? And I called him, and I said, I need you today. I need you to come preach at my church for me. He said, anything I can do, I will. And a man came and got on this platform, <clears throat> preached the house down, and uh, I am forever indebted to you, and I honor the Spirit of God that's in you. Hallelujah. And I pray that God opens the windows of heaven over you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Come here. Come here. Hallelujah. i got to lay hands on you. Yara baba ba samdai. Yara baba samdai. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The assignment of the enemy has been against thee, saith the Lord. You've even thought you were going to lose your mind. There were times that God would move on you and you thought, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I'm not worthy. And the enemy said that, that you have disqualified yourself. But you had not. There had not been anything wrong. But from this night, saith the Lord, as my servant lay hands on thee, this horde of demons that have been sent by hell to snuff you out because of the anointing you are a receptacle of the anointing saith the Lord so this night saith God I supernaturally loose your mind hallelujah these mind bending spirits the accuser of the brethren I will have no more saith the Lord for I say you have not failed I say that your best days are ahead of thee and even I say unto thee that there is an invasion even as I say I'm coming to Nashville I am not just coming to regeneration Nashville but I am coming to every house and every abode that has made room for me I am changing you I'm even changing your theology because I'm going to do things saith God that you thought Lord I didn't know about that but because you're open to me get ready not in the months to come, but this night, saith the Lord, I loose out of thy belly the anointing of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Over all of you, I loose the liberty of the Spirit of the Lord that out of your belly begins to flow the rivers of the living water by the power of God. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. You can be seated. I, I, my introduction tonight for this man of God is this. I, I, I talk to a lot of you. I get your emails. And um, there are so many of you in this building and that are watching online and in other countries. You have literally went through such pain and such devastation and loss. And it's because the enemy wants to make you give up. And sometimes you see leaders on these platforms, you know, and, and we're dressed nice in big crowds. And you get to, the enemy will make you think that they're charmed. And that they don't know what we go through. But the people that God has raised up in this hour as leaders have walked where you walk, whether it's the loss of our son or other things. But the man that I'm going to bring you, uh, bring to, onto the platform tonight to preach the gospel, he is a veteran of the kingdom of God. He has been faithful to congregations of 30 and 35 people for years. He is now faithful to a church that has exploded in North Carolina. He buried his wife two years ago from cancer, and I stood with him in that service. I have watched him walk it out with great victory and authority. His children serve God. <clears throat> so tonight, 
the man that comes to speak to us is no novice. He's walked where you live. He has been where some of you are right now. And he has walked it out with great victory and the mark of excellence. So Pastor Hans Hess, come take your liberty tonight. And we stand and honor the man of God in this house. Come on, give the Lord a praise in here tonight. How do you follow that? Come on. Let's lift our hands in here tonight. Father, we bless you. Come on, Father, we bless you tonight. We magnify you, Lord. Lord, we come into your house, Lord, seeking that, seeking your glory, Father. We're, we're hungry for your presence, Lord. Now, Father, I just thank you for the spirit of the Lord that's here tonight. I just pray you rest upon each one in a powerful way. Change hearts and minds tonight, Father. Do what only you can do in this house, God, and we give you all the honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Can everybody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Give the Lord one more praise. Hallelujah. 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 Turn around and tell about three people, I am the proof. Come on. Just... God is so good. It's so great to be here at Regeneration Nashville. I've come through the years and preached for uh, this church when y'all were in the other location, and it was called the Resting Place. And how many resting place folks do we have here? There's a few. Hallelujah. And I think the name change was a prophetic thing, don't you? That y'all changed the name before this thing exploded. And I just think it was a, was a God thing. I, I love Kent and Candy Christmas. They are amazing people. Just amazing people. Let's give it up for them. Come on. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love the family. Jasmine, John Michael, Nicholas, Carrie. Josh, miss him tonight, but I love this family, and I, I thought about it this morning as Candy was preaching such a phenomenal word that I thought there's a level of excellence here that uh, not just excellence in processes and procedures and systems, but there's an excellence of spirit that's always been in these people. It was just the same way when I would come to resting place or Kent would preach for me through the years, just a level of excellence, and I honor that tonight. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, if you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Mark. Uh, Candy preached from Mark 14, so I'm going to preach from Mark 15. <laughs> I'm just going to follow it up. And everywhere I'm going, you know, I preach a lot. I've, I've preached around a, a lot of camp meetings, a lot of conferences, and everywhere I go, people are listening to you guys. Everywhere I go, people are listening to Kent and listening to Regeneration. It's just really, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling as I'm traveling around the country. And uh, some people ask about all the prophetic stuff, and my response is always the same. I know these people personally, and they're the real deal. They're the real deal. So I'm proud. I'm happy to stand with this church. Amen? and the leadership here, and uh, just believe God's going to do exponentially more than you can ask or think. Amen? So we're approaching Easter here, not this coming Sunday, but next Sunday, and so these themes are in my mind, and in my church, uh, we're preaching through this, and I just can't get it out of my, I just can't get it out of the spirit, so I'm going to deal with it tonight, and I'm going to look at the, uh, what I think, okay, all of Scripture is sacred to us, Right? All of Scripture is God-breathed, it's sacred to us, but I'm going to walk onto a, a passage, a piece of ground tonight that I think is just more sacred. It just, I just feel the holiness of it when I read it. So uh, let's read together Mark chapter 15, verse 33. 
The Bible says, Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Truly this man was the Son of God. You know, proof is important. Proof in trials. Um, I love to read about the proofs uh, theologians have wrestled with through the centuries. Fourth century Augustine talking about proofs of God from the psychology of man or Anselm in the 1100s or Thomas Aquinas talking about different proofs of God. I, I love that kind of stuff because we're, you know, even Descartes in his, in his work, uh, I think therefore I am, I am therefore God is. We're looking for proofs of God and I think it's interesting in Mark that the book of Mark was written probably to a Roman audience. And the word immediately, euthos in Greek, is used over and over and over in this book because it speeds it through. It just goes at a rapid pace. And, and maybe it's because the Romans were used to stuff like we are, you know, texts and, well, they weren't texting, but... They were used to the games and action, and so maybe Mark wrote his gospel that way. And if you look from the beginning, he said he's coming basically to prove who he is as the Son of God. Then the voice of God speaks at the baptism of Jesus, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And now we come to the end, and it's almost like bookends of the gospel from this is my son in whom I'm well pleased to chapter 15, which now a Roman centurion, a Gentile, stands there at the cross and says, truly this was the Son of God. And it seems to be one of the final proofs in the mix of what Mark wanted to show us. So as I looked at this text, I really really started thinking about the centurion. What did the crucifixion look like to the centurion. What did it look like through the eyes of a Gentile? What did it look like through this man who is obviously a hardened man of war? He had probably crucified many other people before Jesus. What did the crucifixion look like through his eyes? And so I want to take you on a journey and let's look at it through the eyes of the centurion. What did he see? First of all, he sees darkness. The Bible says that darkness came upon the whole land at noon and lasted until 3 p.m. Three hours of complete darkness in the middle of the day. And we know darkness often appears as a sign of judgment. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, the ninth plague of ten was darkness that came upon all the nation of, of Egypt. And what was happening in Egypt was the darkness was coming because the curse of God was coming on them. The curse of God was coming upon the Egyptians, and then the final blow would be the death of the firstborn. God was coming in judgment. And I think that's what's happening with the darkness that comes upon the land at the crucifixion of Jesus. God is coming in judgment. He's coming to judge the sin of the world. And here Jesus is, the Son of God, bearing the brunt of the world's sin and the force of the judgment of God. He was bearing, he became a curse, right? Galatians 3.13 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Cursed is everyone. He became a a curse for us. So here's this horrific scene of the judgment of God being poured out on the Son of God. I can't wrap my mind fully around it. I'm just kind of trying to swim in these waters. 
what it looked like that day and what it looks like theologically for the Son of God to be bearing the judgment of God. I have a friend in North Carolina who told me a story recently that there was a pastor friend of his who knew someone who... uh, had a terrible accident, and in the accident, another person involved got got killed. And so they brought this man to trial, and the pastor went and sat with his friend through the trial and watched this whole trial play out. And what was happening was on one side, you had this man who was being convicted of manslaughter. And on the other side, you had a family who had lost a family member in the accident, and they were demanding justice. On one side... Someone was in grave need of mercy. And on the other side was a family demanding justice and judgment. And the gavel fell and the the man who who was in the, the judgment seat was convicted and sent to prison. And the preacher stood there and he said, I wished there would have been someone who could have walked in the midst of that courtroom and bridged the gap between mercy and judgment. But there was no one. How many can lift your hand and say, thank God, but Jesus has come. And bridge that gap for you and I. Darkness upon the whole city at noonday. What what else did he see? Second thing, the, the, the centurion sees Jesus pray. He hears him pray. And he cries out this prayer of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's really David's prayer of complete and utter abandonment as he's feeling like God has abandoned him, and then he's praying, and of course he confides in God, and he's comforted, I think, in Psalm 22. But nonetheless, he feels this sting of abandonment. Theologians call this the cry of dereliction. It's a cry of being forsaken. And the Son of God somehow is being abandoned. And if we understand the Godhead, and I know there's probably different views in here tonight, but let's just try to push it and understand somehow the Father is abandoning the Son, in a sense. There's like a distancing. It's hard for me to understand, but He feels the abandonment because sin brings an abandonment. Sin brings a distancing between you and God. And that is exactly what Jesus is feeling and suffering on the cross that day. It's the abandonment. Isaiah said, your iniquities have separated you from God. It's a cry of someone being cut off. It's a cry, not only the curse of sin, the forsakenness of sin he's feeling. Why is he going through this? Why does this have to happen? He could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him, right? He's the Son of God. Why is he going through this? Well, Hebrews chapter 9 says, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Colossians 2, 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. He had to die because he saw us somehow through the eyes of eternity. He took care of all of the sin debt in one fell swoop and took it all away, bearing the curse and bearing the abandonment that sin produces. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise in this house. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me probe a little bit further, then the centurion sees him breathe his last and die. And as I looked at this, what convinces the centurion of the proof of who Jesus is, is really the manner in which he died. 
if you look at it, it says, when he saw that he cried like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this must be the Son of God. When he saw him die like this. And then Mark adds the commentary that the veil of the temple was rent in two. So what, you know, what, in the ancient temple, there was a temple that separated the, the whole courts of God from the outside. And then there was another veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. So, you know, some people believe that it was the outer veil that was rent, showing that all the world could come in. But I kind of like to think it was the veil separating the holy place from the most holy place. Because in the most holy place was the place where the glory of God dwelt. Dwelt on the, uh, up between the cherubim above the mercy seat on the ark of God, right? And the glory of God dwelt there. And it was that glory that followed Israel through the wilderness or led Israel through the wilderness. Fire by night, cloud by day. That glory that was on the mountain with Moses when he walked into the dark clouds and received the tabernacle blueprint. It was that glory that was tabernacled in Jesus himself. In John chapter 1, which it said, he, there's a term in Greek called skene, that he becomes tabernacled, the glory does, in the form of a person. It's that same glory that I think was always intended not to reside just in a private corridor where only one time a year could one man access that who was without sin and sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat, but God had an ultimate prophetic plan that everyone could have access to the glory of God, that you and I could have access to the glory of God. And when Jesus died on the cross, something happened prophetically. There was a judgment on the temple, a judgment on that system and then the glory of God was released into the earth realm hallelujah so you and I tonight can rejoice in his presence and not sit here without the manifest presence of God but we can rejoice right now and feel the same glory that was in that tabernacle many centuries ago we can feel the same glory that was coursing through the body of Jesus we can rejoice in that same glory that put the priests on their face when they dedicated the temple. I don't know about you, but I feel his glory right now in this house. Why don't you raise your hands and give him a shout in here? Come on, give him a shout in here tonight for the glory. Hallelujah. Okay. Darkness. The prayer of Psalm 22, and then he sees Jesus die. He sees Jesus die. The veil of the temple is rent. The glory is released into the earth realm, and then Jesus dies. And he looks at him, and he says, truly this was the Son of God. But if you think about the centurion, what did he know about the Son of God? He wasn't Jewish. Christianity was not birthed yet. He didn't have the theology you and I have. So I think as a Roman, he understood it as kind of the, he was a divine man. You know, if you study Greek and Roman mythology, they believed in anthropomorphic gods, gods that took bodily form, Zeus and Neptune. And so he sees him, and he sees that there's something different about this man I've crucified possibly many before, but there's a different level. There's something deeper going on here because this man obviously isn't just dying like other man. He seems to be giving his life away. He isn't just suffering like another man. He's suffering for the purpose of others. He isn't just dying a criminal's death there's some power here. The heavens are, are open here. There's something happening. Truly, this was the Son of God. Something different was happening. It was, it was, it was a proof to this guy. This hardened Roman soldier receives this proof. He didn't know what we know, that someone must die for our sins. I picked out a few verses because I like the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul said, I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. 
He had to die because it was prophetically written in the Old Testament that he would be the lamb sacrifice. Is anybody in this church tonight? Y'all got I'm an Appalachian pillbilly preacher. Y'all going to preach with me, all right? He says in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 2, 24, that by his stripes we were healed. Hallelujah. 1 John 2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the entire world. Colossians 1, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. None of this would have happened had we not had the crucifixion. First Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Crucifixion had to happen. Romans 5.10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. He had to die. The darkness had to come. The abandonment had to come. The death had to come. He had to breathe his last. Why? Because when he was judged, he was judged so you and I wouldn't have to be judged. He was judged so you and I could go free. He was judged so that the sentence that you and I deserve would be taken off of us and thrown away. He was judged so the docket in heaven that recorded all of our sins could be wiped away. Hallelujah. Washed in the blood and made completely clean. He was judged. The sky turned dark so you and I could walk in the light and walk in the power of his forgiveness. Hallelujah. He was abandoned so you you and I would not be abandoned. He was abandoned so you and I could be for, forgiven and brought into the kingdom of God. He was abandoned so you and I could be adopted. He was abandoned so we could have a family. He was forsaken so you and I wouldn't have to be alone anymore. He was given up for dead so you and I wouldn't have to feel depression and anxiety. We could have a loving father who would take us into his care and love us like no one ever loved us. Come on, can you believe they give him a shout of praise in this house? Come on, go ahead and give him a praise for what he's done for you. Come on, there's a breaking in here right now. We break this thing in Jesus' name. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise for everything he's done. Give him praise that you're saved right now. You're sanctified. You're washed in the blood. You're set apart. You're filled with the Holy Ghost because of what happened 2,000 years ago. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, how he died so I could live. He died so my sins could be forgiven. He died so I would have hope of a resurrection. He died so that when we bury someone in Christ, it's not the last time. We're going to see them, but we know there's a resurrection day coming when all of them are coming out of that grave. Hallelujah. It's just so long for now. I'll see you after a while. Hallelujah. He died to conquer death. He died to make his way through the portals of death, hell, and the grave. Come out with the keys for you and I. He came so he could stand in the book of Revelation saying, I have the keys of death and hell. Hallelujah. I am he who was and who is and who is to come, the Almighty. Come on, somebody give him a shout, hallelujah. <laughs> come on, somebody give him a praise, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, come on, turn around, high five about three people. Tell them you're about to get loose in this play. Come on, high five about three more. Say, I'm believing you're going to get loose in this place. Oh, Jesus. So, you know, church tradition... Is, is, is good, and there's legends that have come to us through the centuries. And so legends are not always the truth, but sometimes they're based on true history. 
So I went looking for this centurion. And sure enough, the Orthodox brothers helped me. Tradition says this centurion's name was Longinus. And Longinus was the head of this company of soldiers who crucified Jesus. So he walked him through every piece and part of the crucifixion. And Longinus was originally from what would be modern-day Turkey in the east called Cappadocia. And so there are legends that say he was healed miraculously at the cross. There are legends that say he was the one who pierced the side of Jesus. And I don't know, but I'm just trying to search the history and the legends. But according to tradition, it was more when he said, truly this must be the Son of God, it became a conversion to him. It became a statement of faith to him. That I do believe this was the Son of God. And then after that, according to tradition, he and his band of soldiers went and guarded the tomb. And they were the ones there on the morning of the resurrection. And then they were bribed or tried to be bribed to lie about it, and he refused it, according to tradition. And he quit military service and took some of his men up to Cappadocia and there started preaching the gospel and people started getting saved by the multitudes. <laughs> then the Roman authorities in Palestine sent a bounty after his head and went after him. And they walked in the house where he and his soldiers were and they said, we're looking for this man, Longinus. He said, I'm the man. According to tradition, the soldier said, then run, man. Leave. He said, I'm not running. And they were all beheaded. That's why he's a saint in some circles. Okay, that's the tradition. Here's what I get out of it. I think for Mark's purpose, he, who can be a better witness of the resurrection and crucifixion and of who Jesus really was than a non-Jew non-follower of Jesus, someone who was so far out that he becomes a living proof that Jesus is who he said he really was. So when this guy goes out, he's dangerous to the kingdom of the enemy now. Because he can say, they can say, now who are you? You don't know. No, no, hold on. I was there. I was there that day. I saw the sky turn black. I heard him cry out as the Father forsook him at the cross. I was the man standing by when he cried out his last breath, and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man was the Son of God. Wouldn't it be awesome to have that testimony? That you were at the cross and you saw it all go down and I don't care what a scientist says or what a philosopher says or what a professor says, I know what I saw. Well, let's just think of it this way. We weren't there at the crucifixion that day. I didn't see him crucified. I didn't see him breathe his last. I didn't see the sky turn black. But one day when I was 16 years old, I was in a hospital room in my hometown because I'd gotten very sick and I wasn't serving the Lord. I'd been to church that I can remember two times in my life and I, church was the furthest thing from my mind. And then all of a sudden as I was lying in a hospital bed in the dark, a voice spoke to me, not audibly, but something in my heart and I know now it was the voice of God. And it absolutely, radically changed my life. I went home and I didn't know what to do. I just started, I went, I didn't know my mom and dad weren't necessarily going to church. My mom taught me how to pray though. But for some odd reason, they had just purchased a copy of the Bible. And it was the 80s, so it was, it was the book that was published by Tyndall House, you know, Living Paraphrase. And God knew exactly what I needed, something easy. So I walked in and I picked up the copy of the book and I brought it back to my room and I opened up to like the Bible for dummies section. That's like if you've never read the Bible, here's what you must do. And it said, turn to the Gospel of Mark and begin reading. 
And I went to the Gospel of Mark and I began reading and I saw the stories of Jesus as they leapt off the page. It was absolutely, everything became animated and real. And no, I listened to no preachers, no one witnessed to me. I didn't, I didn't listen to gospel music. I didn't have tracks. I just, God was just dealing with me. I didn't know how to get saved, so I got saved every day. I don't want to go to hell. God saved me. That's a good prayer, by the way. It's basically my prayer. God, I don't want to go to hell. Just save me. Just save me. And then I, I knew my, my first cousin pastored a holiness church in the Appalachian Mountains. And one NBC reporter who visited the Holy, holiness churches of southern West Virginia said it was a mix between acid rock and Salvation Army band. <laughs> and so I walked in this holiness church, and I had seen every, you know, I'd seen all kinds of rock and roll bands in concert and been in some wild situations but that church took the cake. I walked in that night, and they were shouting, and they were dancing. Someone got up and had a literal x-ray that showed a bone that was broken, and after prayer, the bone had been healed, and they had the x-ray to prove it. I heard them speaking in tongues. I didn't know what they were doing until a friend of mine says, do you hear them? That's called speaking in tongues, Hans. I said, what? I got so scared, it literally scared the hell out of me. <laughs> It literally scared the hell out of me. I went home and I said, I don't know what's in that church, but whatever is in that church, I got to have it. And, and, and a few months later, my pastor told me, he said, you know what, Hans, you're, you're smart, you read the Bible and all that, but you can't understand it unless you get the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. So I said, okay, what is that? So I went home, and I started praying, and I started praying, and I ran across the next chapter in Mark, Mark chapter 16. And he said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. And I said, Well, God, you said it right there. These signs shall follow them that believe. I'm a believer. You didn't say these signs will follow just the pastors or just the missionaries or just the gospel singers. You said these signs shall follow everyone who believes. And God, I'm a believer right now. And I started praying. And all of a sudden as I was praying, my English turned into another language. And I stopped it because I didn't understand it and was afraid of it. So I said, I just kept praying. I said, Lord, let me, I'm, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to see what this is all about and see if I can get this verified. <laughs> So the next church service I went to, and I sat there praying that the pastor would give an altar call. He gave an altar call. I ran up. I think I'm the first man in line. I stood there. He laid hands on me. I fell out in the Holy Ghost, and it was like a river came gushing out of my spirit, praying in other tongues. I went home that night and must have prayed for three hours in tongues. It sounded like Slavic. It sounded like Asian languages. It sounded like everything until God chose a prayer language for me. And I knew that night that I had some proof that nobody could talk me out of. Hallelujah. I went through a lot of years of education and philosophy classes and theology. But you know what? It, it tempted me at times to take an exit. But I would always come back to the proof of the Holy Ghost and the voice of God that spoke to my life. That totally turned my life around. So I'm telling you what, though I wasn't there at the resurrection, I am the proof tonight of who Jesus really is. Oh, hallelujah. Though I didn't hear him breathe his last, I am the proof of who he is. Hallelujah. Though you weren't there, if you're born again, you are the proof tonight that he really is the Son of God. Some of you used to be... Some of you used to be liars. Some of you used to be drug addicts. Some of you used to be alcoholics. Some of you used to be, uh, you were fornicators. You were cheating around. But now you've been saved, and now you are the living proof that Jesus really is the Son of God. Come on, if you believe it, give him a shout in here tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, shout it out. I am. Come on, shout it out. I am. I am the proof. When you walk in Walmart, it's not just regular old Joe walking in Walmart. It's a Holy Ghost-filled, sanctified, blood-washed, 
fire of God, man or woman, who's living proof that Jesus is real, walking into Walmart. When you go to public school, if you're young in here, hallelujah, all the stuff that they're trying to teach you, it's filtered now through the living proof of who Jesus is in your heart. Now it's filtered through the lens of the Holy Spirit, the lens of the cross. Now you are the living proof of what God can do in that school. Can you believe it with me? Shout hallelujah. The church doesn't need to back down. I love Ken and Candy's philosophy. We need to be as on fire and as passionate and as wild as we can get. Hallelujah. Why? Because we are the living proof that can change a nation, that can change a world, that can change a broken life. You and I are the proof. Give him a hallelujah in here tonight. Come on, shout hallelujah. Come on, I dare you to give him praise. I dare you to stand on your feet and give him praise in here tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, I dare you to give him more praise. Come on, I dare you to stir it up in you. Stir up that gift that's in you. Stir up that proof that's in you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now God has placed in you the authority. God has placed in you the dunamis power for miracles. Now God has placed in you the, the boldness that you need. Now you can go out of this fresh fire conference different. I'm praying tonight that a fresh baptism of fire comes on each one in this building. So you didn't come to Nashville for no purpose, but you're leaving here with exactly what you came for. Hallelujah. That you're going to go out of here, and you're going to go to Iowa and Illinois and Canada and Reading, and you're going to take the fire and the witness of God with you, and you're going to transform your community. You're going to transform your family. You're going to transform your church. Come on, if you believe it, give him a shout. Hallelujah. Hey, come on, give him a shout. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I feel it stirring. Come on, we're breaking through this thing tonight. Come on, stir it up in here tonight, church. Come on, come on, give us some music here. We're gonna, I'm going to believe God to baptize everybody afresh in the Holy Ghost tonight. You know, I preach to a lot of Pentecostals, and they say, well, Pastor, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost in 1972, and it's been great. Yeah, but you know something? The apostles got baptized in the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. Healed the lame man in Acts chapter 3. Were brought before the authorities in Acts chapter 4. And they were beaten and told not to speak again in that name. But you know what they did? They walked right back to their brethren and said, let's pray. And they began praying and they prayed like this, Lord, grant unto your servants boldness, that signs and wonders would be done in the name of your holy child Jesus. First of all, it said they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for their Lord. And then they went out and they prayed for more boldness, and the Bible says, now these are the same guys who would have been in the upper room, the Bible says, then the place was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So it tells me you can be filled and you can be filled again. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That term in the Greek is a continual verb. It means be filled and be filled again and be filled again and be filled again and be filled again. I don't care if you've been serving Him for 80 years. You need a fresh touch of God in your life tonight. You are living proof of who he is. You're living proof of the resurrection. And you need some oil poured on that machinery so you can go back and do everything God is calling you to do. Come on, hands lifted in here. If you want God to touch you afresh tonight. Come on, hands lifted all the way. If you want God to touch you afresh tonight. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. One, one end of this room to the other. Baptize people afresh. Hallelujah. Move by, God, by your spirit, Lord, right now. Baptize people afresh. 
in the name of Jesus. Come on, let it rise right now. Hallelujah. Open up by faith. Open up your spirit. Let the Holy Ghost pour out of you right now. Hallelujah. Come on, from the top of the balcony all the way down to the floor. Let the Holy Ghost come. God wants to do something new in you tonight. He wants to show you something fresh. It's conferences like these that people get called to preach in. It's conferences like these that God, God calls people into the mission field. Come on, it's conferences like these that God shifts your destiny. Go ahead and begin praying until you pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray until you pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, if you're praying, I want you down here right now. Come to the altar. Back up through the aisles. Come with your hands uplifted, faith expecting God to do something in your life that he's never done before. Come on, faith expecting. You are the living proof of the resurrection. Come on, hands uplifted tonight. Praying in the Holy Ghost. God, do your work tonight, God. Do your work afresh. Do your work afresh. Do your work afresh. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord. Listen, if you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost and you're up here praying right now, just keep praying with me right now. And you're going to hear that language change from English into a language you don't know. And when you feel it coming, let it go by faith. Just let it go by faith. God wants to baptize you tonight afresh. There's power of God in this altar right now. You're in the midst of it right now. Just go ahead and speak out what God puts in your heart.
Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is what I hear the Lord saying tonight. <clears throat> I have waited, says the Lord, for this kind of sound to come into heaven. For it is a sound of Pentecost. And when the sound of Pentecost came out of the upper room, in that sound I released keys. This night, says the Lord, I have heard that sound come out of this house. So I am tonight releasing keys, says the Lord, to storehouses in my kingdom that have been closed for centuries. And they are the best gifts that I have. This night, says the Lord, your worship is your key. And tonight, says God, if you will ask, I am releasing gifts. I am opening doors to storehouses that have been closed. And tonight, I loosen this audience, says the Lord, gifts that have been hidden for many, many years. I'm going to change your lives, says God. For tonight, I loose a divine impartation upon this body of believers. And even as the word went out from the upper room around Jerusalem and Israel, <clears throat> so shall this night, saith the Lord, as there are many states that have been represented in this audience, this night, saith the Lord, I make you contagious by my spirit and even as the world has tried to lose a contagious spirit and sickness upon mankind I counteract it tonight saith the Lord by loosening a contagious spirit of the divine Holy Ghost and even as my servant declared the prophecy hallelujah of crucifixion so this night saith the Lord I would not let them rescue me because if I had I could have not rescued you and tonight saith the Lord I am rescuing you from every bondage and every captivity I stand in covenant with thee tonight that I am changing every soul and every individual in this congregation that is hungry for my spirit and because you have come from all over this nation this night saith the Lord is a catalyst that revival is beginning to sweep this nation by the power of the Lord. And even as the disciples stayed in Jerusalem and the church was dispersed throughout the land, this night, saith the Lord, this move will not come just through preachers, but this move will come through the laity that is touching the very hand of Almighty God. So if you are hungry for healing, if you are hungry for gifts, if you are hungry for revelation, ask of me, saith the Lord, for my thoughts towards you are good and not evil upon the young and upon the old saith the Lord I release upon thee I blow the glory of God upon this congregation and from this night on saith God those of you that have touched my glory are being changed for eternity and you will move the kingdoms of darkness by the spirit of the Lord that that is being released to you, saith God. Hallelujah. I believe Hans led us tonight into a place that God wants us to be and that you and I become the proof to the world. As I listened to him preach, I thought, no wonder the world doesn't believe in God because the church has given no proof. Because we look like the world, we use the same entertainment, we have the same, we get the same divorce rate, our children are all messed up, 
and they say, where is your God? But the Lord is raising up, hallelujah, me and you. And together, we are becoming the living proof that truly he is the son of God. And if he is, then the Bible also says he is the firstborn son of many sons. That's us. Well, is this worth coming to tonight? <laughs> it's God. I literally felt like I was going to come apart tonight when I could. There's, there's so much anointing in this house. Hans, thank you for the tremendous word of the Lord. <clears throat> I'm always envious of the scholars, and he is one. You don't know he has a Ph.D., and he would never tell you that. But I love hearing anointed Pentecostal preaching from a scholarly standpoint. And you think, wow, why didn't I think of that? Probably because we didn't go to college for 10 years. <clears throat> we don't speak Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and all of those things, but amen. We have a common language, and that's the love of Christ. So, higher ground, <clears throat> y'all were amazing. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. Brother Timothy, you ready in the morning? <laughs> God's wrecked Timothy. <laughs> Praise God. Well, there's no ceiling on what God can do when he gets a room full of people like me and you that have no limitations on God. Amen. This is good stuff. And uh, tomorrow night will be awesome. I've, I have felt for years that this is where we were going in our ministry and to divine healing, the miracles, the miraculous. And we're going to lay hands on each and every one of you and we're going to see God do amazing things and <clears throat> I believe that the miracles are going to increase and become the proof of the gospel of Jesus Christ so you know it's um, we're doing really good it's only 10 to 9 we have had more power in an hour and 50 minutes and some places have in five hours. <clears throat> Amen. So, I mean, if God wants to last that long, then we won't care because we won't realize it. But um, whenever God leaves, I'm ready to go with him. Aren't you? So, I'm going to let you go. You can get some rest. Um, do you have any instructions, anything? Come prepared. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I don't know what God's going to do, uh, but we have a tremendous prophet of the Lord in the morning. And uh, Hans, that's I said this about my wife this morning. That's the best preaching I've ever heard her do. And I have to say of you, that's the best preaching I've ever heard you preach. And I thought at Elijah Co. I said that about you. You are a wild man. <clears throat> Amen. And uh, I honor the gift of God that's in you and all of the ministers that are here. Uh, we love you. And, and the saints, you're what makes it work. Amen. Just the laity, the body of Christ. So um, you're dismissed in the name of the Lord. We'll see you in the morning at 10 o'clock. God bless you. <clears throat>